On this episode of Cigar and Sea Stories, Mike is rolling solo, sitting down with Mr. Mark Holly. He's a fellow Marine, founder of Atlas Defense, confidence through confidence. You can find him right now at Atlas Defense MN. That's MikeNovember.com, AtlasDefenseMN.com, so that you can follow along on the episode. Mr. Mark Holly, a fellow Marine, he's also an advisor, trained the Afghan uniform police downrange. Uh, so that means he's as crazy as I am. Fantastic to have a brother here on Cigars and Sea Stories. So without further ado, welcome, Mr. Mark Colley. Hey, thank you, Michael. Appreciate being on. Yeah, brother. And he's also from the Great White North. I'm from right across that little pond we call Lake Michigan. Where are you, where are you at right now? Uh, right now I'm in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, cool. Uh, I've been out here for about 10 years now, I am. Nice, nice. So you're running Atlas Defense... Is it, is the MN, is that from Minnesota? Yeah, that was a, that was a little bit of a nod towards Minnesota because I know I want to kind of stay rooted here, but it was also because uh, after I decided to be Alice Defense, that was, that URL was already taken. So I'm like, oh, well, shoot. <laughs> I might as well just represent Minnesota and well, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it when I find the other Alice Defense. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So uh, what do you do over there, Atlas? Um, Alice Defense is a personal protection coaching service, and in that, what I do is I uh, offer a variety of different um, cla- of different classes to uh, teach people about, pro- about personal protection. And some of the services that I offer range from uh, situational awareness classes, which is just like a one-hour class that I'll put on either at a, a local gym. Sometimes uh, corporate people will, or corporate like businesses would uh, hire me for like a one-hour training. Um, I think I was, I've been picked up by a few other random people too. And, uh, it's just a good one hour class just to build, um, situation awareness. And what I do is I teach people about the, uh, Luda loop written by John, yes. as, as, uh, John Boyd taught it. Yep. Yeah. And Observe, that's pretty orient, much what I decide, act. Yeah. And yes. that's pretty much what I, what I teach in that class. And what it's really meant to do is to get them ready for that mindset of personal protection. Yeah. And, you know, just being more aware of their surroundings. And for some people, that actually makes them feel feel safe enough to the point where they, you know, decide that's all they really need to uh, practice for that point. And then other people, if they decide they want to learn about firearms, then that's where I off, that's where I come into and I offer firearms training. And the type of firearms training that I do is more like a uh, progressive firearms training where you can just think of me as like a personal trainer, but instead of the gym, it's on the range. And clients usually sign up for about six to uh, 12 months, and I just kind of take them from where they're at to where they want to be, which is really, honestly, is just basic, like, Marine Corps-style military training. I mean, sure, yeah. I figured, you know, if I was able to run this, we were able to do this type of training with the Afghans and then down in uh, South Africa, too, and with other service members, too. I'm like, if I can train these guys, I should be able to train, you know, your average American citizen. Um, Absolutely. I have to worry about them trying to kill me at the same time. So. <laughs> right. Yes, blue on green. <clears throat> the hair oh, on yeah, my neck so, is standing up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I yeah. So that's what I do with Atlas Defense, and what I really try to concentrate on is letting my clients choose for themselves whether or not they want to pursue firearms training. Because I don't really think that it's my place to be, you know, telling them you have to go get a firearm to feel safe. If maybe if they maybe if they just built up their situational awareness, then that would make them feel just as safe without you know relying on a firearm because. I mean, I know I've I've got a permit to carry, and uh, yeah. I don't carry every single day. I'm pretty sure most people that carry don't carry every single day of their lives either. So, and when you don't, it's because you know you're paying attention to your surroundings, and that's just something I try to teach people. And yeah. it's been slowly catching on, and I'm enjoying it too. So it's been a good ride so far, buddy. You're in. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Right on, man. I commend you, especially coming from a combat marksmanship coach side of things. You know. I yeah, and that was. Being- yeah. yeah, that was one of those jobs that just got kind of dumped on me. Yeah. When I volunteered for something I didn't really know what I was volunteering for, and then I was in Quantico for two weeks for that uh, shooting course. But, yeah, that definitely paid off, too. Yeah. When were you in Quantico for that? Uh, that was 2012. Yeah, that was oh, like okay. the May, fall of 2012. I had 12. Yeah. Yeah. Just missed each other. Oh, really? Eh, kind of. <laughs> 
Well, you know how that was... the military works. I mean, it's one of those things. I was an instructor yeah. over at Weapons Training Battalion, probably where you went, um, mm -hmm. out on out on the big ranges and stuff like that. And yeah, it was one of those things where it's like long hours working with lieutenants and. You know, oh yeah, we saw those OTs out there. <laughs> Three hundred lieutenants at a time. You're like, wow, that's fucking weird. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember my buddy got promoted to corporal the night before we went to that to that course. So we went out. And <laughs> I in the course of the night, I fell out of somebody's truck, hit my shooting eye, and we got on the plane the very next morning. Showed up at Quantico and the gunny that was in charge of checking people in. She was like, "You do realize this is a shooting course, right?" My fucking Entire right eye is swollen shut. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, Corporal Buffy, you just got promoted, so we were just, you know, didn't have a choice but to celebrate. <laughs> but it my the eye will open back up by the time we started shooting, like two days later. So yeah, I told her I knew what I was doing. <laughs> oh my god, were you over in the brick barracks across the grinder over there? Uh, no, we were. Shit, where, where did they keep us? I don't remember, man. That was that does seem maybe we we maybe we were there, but we stayed pretty close to the uh, to the known distance ranges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ugh, all that. And they had that old ass instructor there too. That really old guy that he was shaking every single time he brought the pistol up, but shot better than any of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trust the yeah. movement. It's all in that yeah. front sight post. You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh Jesus. Yeah. Nah, I was. I, I never shot teams, you know, I was always on the combat side of things. Um, I, it was kind of weird because being in Quantico, I saw the influence that a non-commissioned officer could have on a commissioned officer in a very positive yeah. way in the sense that you're the first, you know, NCO or sergeant that they're seeing before they actually get out to the fleet. So we filled yeah, they, a lot of cool questions, you know, oh, just yeah. kind of like sidebar questions. What kind of questions oh, yeah. are you getting from civilians that, you know, doing this, type of instruction um some of the questions come from my uh, experience and whatnot too because i i always try to you know give them a little bit of my uh, background so some people are curious about you know like what i did in the uh, in the military or when i was contracting whatnot too but uh a lot of them are just kind of curious about i guess uh the type of training that we got and uh how they can learn about it i suppose because they just maybe they're just tired of all the other types of training that they're finding but yeah, most of it is just most of it is just you know wondering about my military experience. I mean, everything else is kind of individualized questions, you know, about whatever their uh, shooting questions are. Or some people would really, if they want to work on anything in particular, it's usually just like reloading or um, getting a uh, gun back, uh, clearing stoppages and stuff like like that would be the biggest things that we work on. But mm -hmm. yeah, right, getting your gun back in the fight. Yeah, that's basically it because a lot of people they don't. <laughs> The reason they come to me is because they had some type of stoppage and then they, they panic because they realize they've never really learned how to how to do anything like that. And for us veterans, that's something that's come so second nature to us that nobody really thinks to place very much of a value on it. Yeah. Until you come across people that actually do place a high value on that type of experience. So right. that's what I'm trying to show the other vets that I know too, that they can be doing the same thing that I'm doing with the same we've all had the same experience for the most part when it comes to firearms handling. Yeah, and I'm like, we'll pay you what you're worth, man. Like, I see right. other people charge like 50 bucks for a permit to carry class. And I'm like, how does that pay anything? You know, I charge what we're actually worth and our time is worth, and that's why it comes out to be like 350. And people actually pay that too, you know, when they realize that it's a veteran that's teaching the uh, class. So, right, it's cool to see. And it's cool to try to, you know, we're, I'm working with a few other vets too to do the same thing and seem to be coming together. Very cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've got. I've got the NRA certifications and my CCH instructor certifications mm -hmm. here in North Carolina. And uh, it, I just have never gone that route. I've been doing other things. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm, I'm happy to have all of those certs and stuff. It's just it's odd how I haven't really gone back towards just the gun lifestyle, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, it's something funny where you and I as veterans, we're sitting here, we're talking about this bullshitting about C series you know this is the entire origin of the nra it was returning veterans who were looking at civilians going like fuck man you guys are shit <laughs> yeah. when it comes to marksmanship like we're all gonna die if the british come back here like you, yeah you know, <laughs> we, we gotta rehash some of this stuff you know yeah, yeah. 
I mean, that's the way that I look at it. Jesus, if the threat's anywhere, it's more than likely internal. And, you know, you know all of these stats, dude. Three feet, three shots, three seconds. Yep. You know, you're always shooting your way to cover. What are you doing as far as keeping your gun in the fight? Like, I... And using distance, too. That That's using space and distance to your favorite, too, is something I think a lot of people don't place a lot of emphasis on because they're really thinking about it. Yeah. But really, like, that's what that's what helps with the situation awareness classes, too, and the application. If you just use use space to your advantage, and that's something that we all kind of learn about from the very basics of, you know, fucking clearing rooms and whatnot, too, is mm-hmm. how do you work the space. So trying to get them to think in that type of mindset, too, is uh, interesting to see go on, you know. Yeah. that's funny see i'm just thinking about it because i've had guys ask questions about like oh man all right so how many hours of practice does it take to beat john wick oh god God. (laughs) oh yeah i guess well like with like movies too like i people always ask me questions during fucking movies i'm like no i'm not gonna be that i'm not that guy that (laughs) that ruins the entire movie by criticizing every single movie (laughs) well and when you're sitting there watching the movie you're like oh god damn it uh that's not that's not right. It's a TV show. It's a TV show, yeah. Mike. Yeah. I yeah. Know. You know. <laughs> yeah. You bastards. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, like you, know, uh, you did some. What's that? I would say, yeah, as I say with John, I saw there's another John Wick coming out, too. Yeah, I was watching a trailer for it earlier awesome. today. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching that one. <laughs> Dude, Keanu knows what he's doing with the fire on. That guy's Actually, not fucking Yeah, around. I saw it. He actually is. He's actually kind of drawn some attention to Three Gun too, after those videos were, were posted. And I've had a couple of people come to me saying they want to get ready for a Three Gun, and that's nice. what they hired me for. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So when they're hiring you for this stuff, I mean, are you giving them a proposal with a given time period that you're going to be working on, so on? Yeah. Are you getting payment up front. You know how? Yeah. So how? how yeah. Walk us through it. Yeah. Yeah, so the whole client flow, yeah. So what 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 happens is, uh, I ideally, you know, a client would come in, say, for just like a, a situation awareness class, twenty bucks. That's where we kind of initiate con- contact and start to build a relationship. And then if they come to me and they decide that they want to do some type of firearms training, we'll sit down and talk for like a half hour or so about their training experience. And I just kind of take all that information and turn it into a training plan, and I put that into a statement of services contract and. When I was getting everything ready, I was trying to think of what would be the best way to get everybody the type of training that they want. And instead of like having one overarching general class that everybody just signs up for, um, instead I just kind of turn it into a services contract. So they get, so they see exactly what they're getting. I know what I'm expected to do, and you know everybody's happy. And every, and they get that extra kind of layer of uh, um, special attention and whatnot too, because I try to sell this kind of like as a high end luxury product, mm-hmm. and. You know, adding the uh, exclusivity of a of a contract and making sure everybody knows exactly what they're getting is uh is actually a great way to make somebody you know feel like they're getting something very personal. And that's what Israel is producing too. So, yeah. and then with uh, payment, sometimes it's it's month to month. Sometimes they pay all the way um everything like up up front if it's like a, a present. I had a uh, some fiance contacted me and bought like a full year for her uh, husband. Which was like an awesome wedding present. <laughs> the yeah. guy was pretty stoked about it. <laughs> Hell yes, like, that's oh. awesome. Yeah, she's like, oh yeah, for your wedding present, I hired a private firearms coach for one year. So yeah, he was pretty stoked about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, well, right on, dude. Oh, yeah, you're giving away kind of is... that's dude. That's that's mission accomplished right there. Mm. I gotta say. You know, yeah. if somebody is willing to give your service as a wedding present, you're nailing it, man. Yeah. You're, uh, yes. Right on. She was one of my first clients, too, actually, that bought the uh, Range Club, too, because she saw the uh, value in it. And, you know, just one of those things being connected to the right people at the right time, because I knew the, the type of like demographic I was looking for, but it was getting really hard to connect to it. But that was like one of the first ones that came through. So it was pretty cool to see. And yeah. I'm running with him right now, too. So. It's a fun thing to write these training plans, and it's basically, you know, stuff that you and I would just think of, like, think of any type of uh, table one through six drill, really, and that's what we're doing pretty much, and uh, yeah. it's really fun, too, yeah, and they and they absolutely have a great time, because nobody's ever taught them anything besides shooting at a piece of paper, you know, seven yards away. 
Right. Because there's a zombie on her or something. <laughs> right. If, now, do you ever incorporate like laser pistols? Have you seen these? Um. Yeah, I've I've uh, seen those. The only like the only time I bring in a a gun like object was a CO two gun a couple of times for some. I had a client that was very old and <laughs> she was really scared about shooting a three eighty, so we had her shoot an air pistol once, but. I haven't really, we haven't used any lasers or anything like that. Um, as far as like teaching him side alignment and sight picture, we actually have a couple of the training aids and whatnot to help to try to demonstrate that. Yeah. So, yeah. I was just curious because I started messing around with some of those blue laser guns. Oh, yeah. That, you know, they're, they're just electronic and so they slightly reciprocate in a movement, you know, just kind of a little bit of recoil in there. Oh, um, you know what? But they're yeah. fun, man. I'm telling you what, because. The person, quote unquote, firing or maneuvering around, they're looking at this blue gun and they're going, OK, this is kind of it's more of a toy. <laughs> right. But if you do the scenario correctly, just like you and I understand, if you're if you put a blue barrel. Right. Remember Sesame training? Oh, yeah. I was going to say there is actually we got something like that, too. Um, it's like a judgment simulator from from what you're talking about, too, where they have that type of blue gun and whatnot. Yeah, that was something that's one of the local ranges just uh, opened up too. But anyways, yeah, with your with the uh, blue guns, yeah, I know what you're talking about. They don't really when they pick it up, yeah, they're like, "What the hell?" <laughs> right. And well, then when you can't. have a yeah. blue barrel, you don't you're not walking around going, "Oh, yeah, I got a toy for a blue barrel." I mean, if you <laughs> if the scenario is correct, you're in the you're in the moment, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. so, anyway, I, I've noticed that with those limited feedback you see the laser there's a little bit of recoil to it what have you you know so yeah i hate to say it but it's less emphasis on the fundamentals and more so on quick to the gun sure to the grip you yeah. know first round yeah. range essentially it's getting through that type of action but yeah fun. i don't really yeah anything like that i i would i use more so just for like the the situation training Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like that's why I never really thought to, to that I would ever want to use a laser as like an actual training aid because it kind of like one of those things like you say so yourself you know it's something that can't be really translated consistently right. all the way across yeah right but yeah it's kind of yeah that was something that one of the ranges around just have just added and it's kind of cool to see that you know people are actually putting that out there more to that maybe you should think about more than just the one class that's required for every five years right <laughs> you know to get your to uh, carry so yeah. Well, if you're zoning out right now listening to us in traffic and you haven't already done so, check out Atlas Defense MN. That's MikeNovember.com. We're talking with Mark Colley, fellow Marine. I'm on the About Us page of AtlasDefenseMN.com. And uh, <laughs> you're, knelt you're kneeling down, no flack, right? You're rocking boots and hutes with a... <laughs> With with a plate carrier on and what's he got there? Is that I mean it's an AK, an don't get me wrong. But uh I, I'm loving I'm loving the earmuffs, I'm loving the full blue <laughs> AUP, which of course is just bringing me back. Uh <laughs> walk me through what's going on here. I mean, are we doing a side adjustment? Yeah. So in that picture, uh that was when we were working with the Afghans on on the on the range, obviously, and uh, that was uh, each one of us had to go on to each. There was only one Marine per uh, shooter because with most ranges you you can have one you know instructor for an entire firing line, but fortunately you know we had to have one guy on on each uh, on each student because of the insider threat and whatnot. Right. But we also because they were so unsafe and unpredictable, <laughs> we had to uh, get pretty much put our hands on them quite a bit because they would turn around and flag the entire line or then they would say that the barrel is bent or something. So at some, I'm sure they're right about there. I'm probably just saying, no, you motherfucker. There's <laughs> the barrel is not bent. You just suck at shooting. Right. Because there's, you know, the, and the interpreters would be running around the entire time. So it's a whole lot of, a uh, lot, there's a lot of uh, confusion going on on the range, but we were still able to get them to shoot a little bit better, you know, when we're out there, but what was going on that page is on that photo. There's probably just some confusion. <laughs> and that's, Dude, and that's why I still was like, like I said, I've, and that's why I, I put that up there to remind myself too, that no matter what, you know, it's never going to be that bad again. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, dear God. Yeah, man. Up in Kajaki with the cops up there, we did a full, like, we did all of their weapons. We, we went through all of their weapons in classroom in a platform instruction. Then we did a weapons handling period of instruction. Yeah. 
you know, so this is weeks that we're doing these mm-hmm. things, right? And then did a full live fire range, but it, it, we didn't have HESCO barriers and an actual operating range to go off yeah. of Kajaki. We were just kind of up at the flat, you know, and so we took an LZ, uh, pallets were our targets that were out there, cardboard with the right size target on it mm-hmm. that I spray painted on there. And then I spray painted a bunch of ammo cans and stuff. Uh, yeah. I had a, I had like two guys that helped me with the pallets. Other than that, I did pretty much all the rest of it myself, which was fun. <laughs> it was like, you know what it is, you know, you're bored on deployment yeah. and you're like, dude, just stay the fuck away from me. I'm going to do my thing over here. And I, yep. I had 550 cord with that green duct tape, you know, as, as <laughs> yard lines all the way back. So we did like uh 2550, 75, 100, 150. And I understand how to use the, you know, case add a collision cost side adjustment right. tool. So we're making side adjustments on there and stuff. It was good. We didn't have nice. any range incidents. We had proper line of death and line of clear and all of that other stuff. It was cool. Yeah. You know, point of pride yeah, from the yeah. you know from the instructor yeah. side. Yeah, man, Ugh. I know what it's like. Yeah, but those guys, yeah, those Afghans, they they actually lived with us on that on that base too, and every freak, and it was always funny because they were they were allowed to have cell phones some somehow, and they would never get touched by the IDF, of course, even though we're like on the same base, but their part would never get touched. <laughs> right. They were definitely like this, despite how dumb they may have looked. They were definitely a lot more organized than I think that <laughs> the Australians were uh, letting them on to be. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So you were working with the Aussies. What was that like? Um, that was pretty cool, man. I actually got I've stayed in contact with with uh, quite a few of them. Uh, we were working directly with uh, the Afghan or, or with the uh, Australian Federal Police, but the Australian Army was on the base too, and they were the ones that drove those big ass uh, Bushmasters. You know what I'm talking about? Like those like things with like freaking monster trucks. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. This, yeah. They were a mounted unit that was uh, out of there too. But we mostly just worked with the federal police. And since we were, since I was military police and then the other guys on my team were infantry, I guess ISAF or NATO or whoever thought that they needed to throw another police expert or something on it. So they, uh, they were brought in and there was like, I think it was like seven, six or seven of them at any given time. But they were always going on R and R and, taking bad vacations because <laughs> they got better rotations than, than we got. And they would, at least they would bring us back booze. <laughs> Hell yes. Yeah. Dude, the Aussies are hilarious, man. Yeah. They're always joking around yeah. and doing cool shit. Yeah. I found that about the Aussies and Royal Marines. I mean, that's oh, yeah. Just, you know, and with good reason, too. I mean, what was that? World War Two, right? <laughs> What's that? that and, and with good reason, too, after the Pacific campaign. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, see? So I'm still remember. Right? Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I always just find it so funny because whenever we interchange, the services are always, you know, we're just very unique and different. Marines are fucking uptight. We are uptight. Yeah. You know, everything about us is strict and no booze and you know, we've always got to look proper and pomp and circumstance and all of this other shit. And I would expect it more so out of, you know, like the royal side of things or whatever. Yeah. No. It's the exact opposite, man. We we're laughing and goofing and smoking and joking. And, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was yeah, that was why uh, it's. It, I was so thankful that after I joined the Marines, I realized why I'm so glad that I did. Because at the time when I chose to do it, I'm like, I don't really know why, but I guess I want to take the hardest route. <laughs> right. But that's what it got me though. So I'm glad I did. Yep. Yeah. Hey, what type of weapon systems were those Aussies shooting? Uh, they had the. Uh, Shit, the uh, Og H bars. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, I, yeah. There, it was like it was essentially just that 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 little that uh, it was just a uh, bullpup, and uh, it was pretty. I mean, it was a nice gun, and they were, they they all got uh, full auto too, which when we were hit the range, we would always trade them up and whatnot, right? <laughs> because uh, they for some reason were able to, to justify full auto still in you know 2016 or 2012 back then, yeah. yeah. But yeah, they were fun to shoot. We got that was a good that was another kind of advantage of being over there too is we have to shoot the uh singaporeans and some of the germans guns and whatnot too because we, they would all want to come out and shoot at, at the range and for the most part we were camped out there like two or three days throughout the entire week so we got to shoot a bunch of fun stuff when we're out there too nice hell yes yeah. see that's that's the type of experience that a lot of fellow marines are like damn it dude i wish i could you know like the over yeah. in quantico the pws armory 
Mm-hmm. You know, like going through small arms weapons instructors course and and that and foreign weapons is the same package. So you just shoot a whole gamut of different types of firearms yeah. and threat weapons and everything else. God, that was some of the most yeah. fun that I had in the Marine Corps. That was like the most coveted course, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. dude. I thoroughly enjoyed that type of shit. We were finding all sorts of different types of threat weapons around our AO. You know, and I'm a dork for guns, so I'm, of course, like, the second that I find any receiver, I go back to my knowledge and start going through when I'm trying to figure out manufacturer origin and country of origin and passing shit on, and, yeah, I'm just, I don't know. I found all sorts of unique firearms that were out there, French, uh, what did we find? It was like a French version of a PKM. Okay. Yeah, but it was all rusted to shit. The Afghans brought it in all happy as fuck, thinking that they found some (laughs) Taliban weapon. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Dug it up from two decades ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Well, it was, you know, it was the AUP. They were out fucking around on the edge of the lake, and they were like, oh, yeah, we found this thing. They brought it back. Like, ah, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Working with the AUP. Did you ever patrol with the AUP? Uh, no, we would just, the only time we would just go out once in a while to go and check out on their, uh, on the police outpost that was out there. But yeah. that would be like, we only did that like maybe once a, once every other month or something. But for the most part, we were just straight up hobbits and we just, we stayed around there for the most part. But when we did go out there with them, they would just, somebody would always either roll their truck or they would always fall off about halfway through. So, Jeez. and then with how narrow that the streets were too, it would, I would like, we should have just hiked the entire way, but we just drove out there, and then you had to walk the last 500 yards up to the uh, police station. But yeah. yeah, that was about the most that we would do, though. And they would just do that because you know we had to do a KLE, and somebody had to drink some tea or some shit. Right. So oh, my God, I had drank enough chai to last a fucking <laughs> lifetime. Yeah, I guess yeah, especially an officer. Yeah. Jesus. You guys well, and it's like it was my counterpart because I was. I was, uh, how do I put it? My counterpart was like their sergeant major, right? Okay. So I was a sergeant. Don't get me wrong. I was an E5. It's just, it's like, I, uh, anywhere that we went, you have to do the dog and pony show. And some of the guys that were on the, out on the trucks or whatever, are like, oh man, they get yeah. to go up there and do that. I'm like, dude, fuck this, man. I would rather be smoking and joking in that fucking Humvee right now than I would be <laughs> sitting up here trying to figure out what this guy's saying in posh doing. Like, I don't give a shit. Can we go yeah. can we go train <laughs> or something? Uh yeah. But cheesy yeah. potatoes. That always came yeah. with a shuro. For some reason they love giving us cheesy potatoes. <laughs> you know, it's 120 what? degrees outside and we're eating fucking hot cheesy potatoes, drinking hot chai. Because they're being respectful. Like, oh <laughs> whatever. At least they didn't give us water. Yep. <laughs> So. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, dear God. So you're an MP by trade, though, huh? Yeah, that was what I went to school for. Um, when I when I joined the Marines, I decided, you know, because of a of an ex-girl to be in the reserves. And if I wanted to be in the reserves, then I had to be in the military police. So that's what I was by uh, trade. And but, I mean, as, as a reservist, you mostly just trained for up until 2000. 10, 2011, they were being used for convoy security. Mm-hmm. And then about right about when we deployed, we were one of the first waves to go out there as uh, as police trainers. And then all of a sudden, they're like, oh, now you have to be actual police, you know, experts in one year or something. Right. So that was uh, that was a that was kind of a fun change. Yeah, a lot of, <laughs> they, you know, a lot of fellow Marines even don't realize that there is a, a huge field side to the military police there's a field side and then there's like your organizational side and then there's the pmo side yeah right the pmo side and in the reserves too you know there's no point in having pmo reserves is what are you going to do that but you know once a month (laughs) so that's why it's probably cheaper for them just to do the field side but yeah there's active duty uh field side units too and i think most mps kind of rotate through two years on one two two years on field side and two years on pmo and yeah. sometimes if they, if they like one better than the other, they try to stay on, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I got a you- soft spot for MPs because we had them on the teams that we were with and, you know, rotating them through. Some of the section leaders are MPs also. And there were some okay. really good field side guys. 
who are catching flack for being MPs, and they're like, dude, I've never served a single day as fucking PMO, okay? I don't wear, exactly. I don't wear a cop belt. Fuck that. Yeah. I'm flacked up with all you guys. I'm rolling, doing convoy shit. I'm like, whoa! Easy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of them definitely get a little bit more butter about it. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I already, yeah, I was MP. I don't, I don't really care. That's See, why I, I, yeah. I'm the asshole who stokes the fire. I'm like, yeah, you're almost a grunt. Bing, bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. No, I got a couple of fellow, you know, fellow grunts that were on teams. We had infantry and then we had MP and we never really had. I mean, looking back on it, we never really had an MOS rivalry, you know, because Marines are always just that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody shits on the RO. That poke motherfucker better make calm work. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <Yep. laughs> Baron, I love you. So um, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was my RO. Yeah. Oh, dear God. Jesus, is my RO. <laughs> Dude, looking back. <laughs> Like, one of the worst things about working with the AUP, honestly, it wasn't it wasn't working with the individual guys. They were all good dudes. Yeah. You know what I mean? For the most part. Well, right? yeah. And it was their, up, you know, it was their upstairs. So it was, it was their higher-ups. Exactly. Yeah. I just like, saw it. Yeah, the Afghan uh, National Police, or the, their, it was one of their, like, higher-ups. They just got arrested for uh for corruption and bribery. It was like their their chief of police in in Kabul. Ugh, I'm shocked. <laughs> he just got arrested for that. Yeah, like every and they put it on the news like it's a big shocker. Yeah. That was the biggest thing. It's accountability. That was yeah. always the biggest thing. That was that was what we preached when we were downrange. That's the whole integrity basis of the military. That's it's all about accountability. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like. Well, it's even it's even now. It's even stateside. It's I carry a gun with me wherever I go. If I don't carry a gun with me, it's because I'm probably flying somewhere where I can't carry a gun with me. I'm not licensed, you know, out of state like California or Illinois or Massachusetts or something yeah. like that. Um, but other than that, I pretty much carry a gun with me wherever I go. and I'm accountable for that. Yep. You know, right. people who want to be accountable for this. <laughs> Go to folks like you, Atlas Defense, MN. Yep. That's MikeNovember.com. Dot com. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And that's uh yeah, that that uh website too is something that I I had no idea what I was doing. I made that thing and I can't believe it's still the 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 guy that I hired, uh, Dara put that website together. <laughs> nice. It was much worse than what you see now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how it you goes. know. I guess as 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 a business owner too, I'm sure you know how the whole uh, website development thing goes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Cigars and seed stories didn't look like that. Yeah. <laughs> no hell no. Spartan Media, fellow Marine, he was mm -hmm. the one who hooked it up. That's how we yep. do this. Yeah. yeah. So with Atlas Defense MN dot com. Now, do you have other links to you anywhere else that people can follow you? Um, yeah, on uh, on Snapchat, I'm just Atlas underscore Defense, and that's just kind of my uh, a little bit of uh, you know my my clients. I I usually try to drop some training tips throughout that uh, social media too. Same thing on my uh, on Instagram. Same thing uh, Atlas Defense MN, just all one word. I'm on Instagram as as well, and usually post uh, just some uh, training tips. And every now and then, if there's a special going on, or if we have an event that we're hosting, we announce it through that and on facebook too just uh alice defense backslash uh alice defense M mn if you notice a common theme there <laughs> right pretty much everything is going to be at alice defense mn i'm on twitter too um at alice defense mn so that's uh all the social media and my uh wife and i well my my wife is a business owner too actually and she's the one that got me started and and kind of inspired me to get started and start my own business when i got back home from uh, my last contract because we agreed that I suck at being a uh, <laughs> employee, so that's uh, what we're doing now. And yeah, like I said with my wife and I, we we run that. We run a uh, every Sunday night at seven o'clock Central Time. We run a Facebook Live, and we just kind of mm. keep we just kind of run it to keep ourselves accountable to the products that are going on and try to get the word out there about everything that we're working on and give shout outs to people that are that we're that we're working with too because we have to supply as local as we can. For me, even if it's I, if it's my ammunition or my gun builders or anything else in the ranges and whatnot that I work with too, so 
it's fun to bring everything together, you know, one, once a week on that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great, dude. Fantastic. Well, yeah. I applaud you for being a, uh, a veteranpreneur and kicking ass and taking names in the way that you are. I, yeah. I wish you much success as the business grows. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to working with Bunker Labs, too, because I that whole thing just kind of came out of nowhere, and I couldn't have come at a at a better time too. So, yeah, we just had the first, yeah we just had our first meeting this past Wednesday. There was a lot of stuff, a lot of ground that got that got covered, and got to meet the all the other guys that are in the program and uh, the people that are gonna be putting the classes on there. Nice. Feel pretty privileged to be out there. So you're linked up. To oh, sorry, mm -hmm. what? I said I'm looking forward to it because it's just cool to see all the other chapters, you know, throughout the United States too that are working independently but also you know like towards the same goal too i was just out in new york uh, a couple months ago and got to meet up with uh, tim out there nice. and that was cool to see or chris yeah chris shaw yeah yeah chris tim yeah. now speaking of Tim's tim over here working with yeah. tim o'neill yeah 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 very cool Tim's here in Minneapolis. chris is over yeah they're in new york yeah. so yep it's cool hell yeah, yeah man I if you're ever down here this way you know we've already chatted prior to this on the director of programs with bunker rdu so by all means hit yeah. us up if you're in the raleigh durham area so i'd love oh, yeah. to there's, take you out go shooting yeah there's a uh, out there in that area there's definitely a bunch of uh few other marines i know in the area too that would like to come out and do like a range day type type of thing to meet some more guys face to face because that's something that i've seen that's been helping with the uh, vets to uh, the guys that we that we work with. We just kind of get them together and hit the range, and just one thing for us to get together and get out of the house for you know. Yeah. So it's been a great thing to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Because every once in a while, I look around and try to figure out what the fuck civilians are doing in there. I just don't yeah. know. What yeah. do they do? <laughs> I try to study their habits, you know, <laughs> but I can't watch that much TV myself. I need to add value. You know, <clears throat> anyway, just a little, yeah. you know, a little ribbon for, for Civ Div. Well, hey, dude, I yeah. appreciate it. folks out there in Radioland. Check out Atlas Defense MN. That's Mike November, AtlasDefenseMN.com. So look up Mr. Mark Holly over here. Get yourself trained up. Well, for our listeners, more than likely, you guys are already highly proficient with firearms. So how about you either kind of like grab the bull by the horns yourself maybe learn some tips tricks mark are you open to connect with i am always veterans? open to connect yeah cool. i'm always open to connect with guys that are interested in getting into this line of work because you guys we all we have the skill set and a lot of us forget that we have that and it's something that you can monetize as a side hustle pretty quickly and it, you know you get what you put out you get your you get what you put into it and i'm putting a lot into it right now nice. <laughs> but even you know what I mean? So definitely feel free to contact me anytime with questions about getting into this because you guys are more than capable of doing this too. Cool. Well, we're definitely going to be talking offline. There's, oh, some, yeah. there's some other things I got to do. You know, I got to dust it off. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Let me hear your war cry. Okay. Come on. Let me hear it. Where is it? Oh, say, yeah, my, <laughs> say again? <laughs> well, let me cry? hear your war cry. Ah! Yes, he did it. Yes. We get like one and four. That's awesome. Semper Fi, brother. I appreciate your time here. Thank you so much for joining us on Cigars and Sea Stories. Mark Holly, everybody. Look him up. AtlasDefenseMN.com. Mark, yeah. you're an awesome dude. Yeah, and thanks to the peanut gallery. We've got a fellow Marine in the background. Quick shout out. You want to grab the mic and just do something crazy? Uh, I don't really have anything. Oh. Is he drunk back not there? Not. I hope he is. Please no, tell I'm me. Not. I don't, you know... While I was in, it was a bad habit, so I, I cut it out. Oh, good for you. Good Thank for you. Thank you for your service. That's what's up. You and I, we're in the same team, bro. Yeah, I feel you. All right, yep. folks. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Cigars and Sea Stories. It's fun doing these little solo interviews. Sorry that Bennett wasn't on the hook right now. He's moving. No He's moving again. He's moving again, people. I know. Keep track yeah. on the whole Bennett Tanton family. Ooh, circus. <laughs> awesome. Mark Holly. Thank you again, bro. Semper Fidelis, thank you for joining us on Cigars and Sea Stories. Folks, subscribe, rate, review, time now on iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, iHeartRadio, YouTube, SoundCloud, or anywhere that you could possibly listen to a podcast. That's where we're at, and you can listen to our RSS feed that is going out to you every Thursday and Tuesday. Thank you so much to our 
Sponsors, VeteransList.us, Spartan Media. We are proud members of Heroes Media Group Network, a veteran-owned and operated podcast network. Thank you so much to you, our audience members, who matter most of all. Click subscribe, share it with a fellow veteran. Get us out there, folks. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Cigars and Sea Stories. And on that note, we cue the music.